And welcome to Rich Sports. Today we're going to be continuing our tactics podcast series, looking at playing out from the back. So I want to welcome back regular guests on this podcast series. Welcome back, Bath Time. Welcome Thank back, Mondi. Hope you both hope you both good. Hope you both enjoyed the, the football on the weekend. A lot to enjoy there, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll go first. Yeah, I really enjoyed the weekend. Um, obviously, for Man United, it was a positive result. Um, it's good to see, like, when you talk about tactics and things like that, we're trying to watch games now when we're doing the show every Monday night. It's um, a regular thing now. So on the Wednesday night, we played a team and they had the uh, edge on us, I think, tactically in the first half. Manager made some amendments and uh, we got a result in the end because we were 2 0 down at one point. And it's really interesting, isn't it? You have to play the same team again on the weekend. So, look at, looking forward to this show, I'm thinking, all right, what's he going to do? How is he going to turn it around? And uh, I did like, uh, I always do prediction videos on Stretford Paddock. And I actually said, and I put it out there now, I put it out on, on social media. I said Harry Maguire should play instead of Varane. And um, based on what we were talking about last week, if you haven't seen the show last week, guys, it's a really interesting um, thing. Shavran, world-class player, obviously, but there are everyone's got some limitations, and I think that his limitations were exploited um, by Leeds United. So for him not playing the other day, we got a clean sheet. I thought Harry Maguire played okay. Obviously, he was going to make a lot of mistakes. Everyone's under pressure against Leeds. Um, they were put a lot of teams under pressure, a lot of players under pressure throughout the whole season. That's how they play. So I, I thought it was a great result to win 2-0 away from home at Leeds. Um, they're ruthless. Their fans are ruthless. They put it on you. And uh, we had to hold out. And I know people were a bit peed off because they felt that we weren't playing good enough. We were supposed to walk through this team, but this is the Premier League. And I think these players are so fit, so strong. It's just a little bit of quality, a little bit of tactical now that really got our goals. And uh, little lovely, the goal was made by something we didn't do the whole game from a midfield little play, one, two, three, and switch to play with Sabitza. And suddenly we're in a situation where we can get across in the numbers in the box. And it was, it was yeah, I, I, there's so much to talk about. But overall, I just love taking it all in. And uh, coming back to the show and, you know, bumping heads with you guys. Iron sharpens iron. And I, I just take it so much. I hope you guys... I was thinking the same thing. This is great I show. think I was more confident the second game, thinking that Ten Hag, from what I've seen, will adapt and make changes. Because we once we recovered from uh, giving away two goals to Leeds really cheaply, I think we were the better team midweek. And we, we were the team that looked most likely to win. So, you know, lots to take in. And hopefully lots more to take in tonight as well. But cheers, um, Niall, for joining. Cheers, JR. Um, please share the stream if you if you can. Get other people, yeah, let people know. Because any any questions when we're live is quite quite useful as well for everyone watching. Yeah, wicked. Um, thanks everyone who's watching. I hope that you um, you got a lot out. You know, we struck gold a little bit last week by talking about um, how pressing works before we played Leeds. So. I hope that a lot of you sort of saw like how they were sort of like halving the pitch. They were so narrow. Um, everyone was, was man marked and stuff like that. Um, and hopefully you know what a press is. But today, as you can tell from my wonderful AI generated uh, thumbnail of uh, David <laughs> on the beach. <laughs> it's the future of Monday, AI thumbnails. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, talking about playing out from the back and uh, I'm sure that a lot of you have got like views on um, what happened on Sunday because I've never seen like a, a sort of storm like it from watching Manchester United before um, so we'll go through how I think you should play out from the back and principles and things like that and then maybe we can all be in a better position to sort of analyze that game um but yeah and this is going to sound a bit weird but in order to sort of like understand playing out from the back you need to know what a counter press is so um we didn't do it last week but we're go we're going to do it now um it's not it's not particularly difficult um although a lot of people do seem to misunderstand it but if anyone has any questions about anything that they want they want to know um, we can address them because I've seen Niles asked about Rashford. Um, if we've got time, Niall, um, we, we can talk a little bit about Rashford and why he's doing better as a striker now than he was last year. 
the 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 key is he's staying central but anyway i'm gonna try and work out how to get my screen up but whilst i do that amonde do you remember how to um do you remember anything about the counter press when we did it on the eye test uh yeah it's um creating a situation where you can win the ball back or, or opposition would have the ball you can pinch the ball off them and then uh set, set up a trap for them set up a trap for them and uh win the ball back off them and then press and go go forward so a counter press is sort of getting the ball off the opposition in a certain area and then being able to sort of uh attack on goal yeah that i mean yeah that's that's basically what it what it is um am i on screen rich yeah yeah you're there you're there oh yeah oh right okay sorry i'm just uh, doing my stuff out. okay so the first thing that you need to know about um like the counter press is what it's designed for and what it's designed for is stop transitions right it's it's a defensive technique and because it's defensive what do all defensive tactics need to be in order to work rich what defensive tactic organized well obviously but um i even told him this in a private message yesterday did you yeah they need to be narrow narrow okay yeah okay every defensive yeah. tactic needs to be narrow but we're playing an attack right so we can't just be narrow so how how a team sets up is like this where it's still compact do you see how we've got like um nine players all in one one section and then the width is coming from our winger from our two wingers in this case yeah hello can you hear me yeah can you oh good sorry right okay um okay and then this structure here is the rest defense right so what happens is is that around here someone loses the ball okay so we go into a counter press um there are many different ways that you can counter press but the three things that like inform the counter press are ball man and space right so if we put some enemy players here that doesn't matter who they are um if we put some enemy players here and they've got the ball the person that is nearest the ball in a counter press will press that means they'll go straight at them and what you will tend to see is um you will see these players here cover and everyone else will either orientate themselves onto a man um which is essentially what united do or they'll try and block the passing lane and what that means is that the you either win the ball back and everyone's completely disorganized on the on the other team so that you're then in an attacking transition and you have a great opportunity to win a, to to like create a chance um or they go long in which case um you've got a, enough players to deal with it or because the best defender in the world are monday i know you're on mute but just mouth it with me is the touchline i'm it not is... yeah sorry I, I was on mute but i'm back yeah. now sorry about that that's all right um it gets booted it gets booted out of play and like in the systems that i've played um the way we've done it is that you just keep doing it until they go home they go wide they go long or it goes out whereas with people like pep and ten hag i believe that they they i've read somewhere that they have like six second rules or ten second rules like you know when you drop something on the floor in the kitchen um and that is essentially all a counter press is now this, the reason this is important to build up play right is to do with the shape and so if you don't take anything away from anything that um i talk about tonight this is the most important thing is that every football team needs to be compact at all times whether that's in attack or if that's in defense if you're not compact you don't have any protection against transitions so this is why you have a rest defense because what it means right 
sorry, I've, I've left something out, but you still need width. So one player will always be out wide, right? And one player is in a wide position here. You see the 11 7 are in the wide areas, yeah? yeah? All right. You've got your fullback inverting in order to cover the centre that allows this guy out here. And this has led to the two different types of winger that we're seeing in football at the moment. Whereas this one here is more of a combination winger. So I would imagine Jaden Sancho is this. Um, this is someone who's good at sort of like playing between the lines, playing quick one twos, all that kind of stuff. And the far side winger. So if you think like um, Mane or Mares, players like that, this is the direct one on one winger who will get isolated against his man and go on the outside or cut in and shoot or, or whatever. And because we're so compact, we use these triangles here. So we use like this sort of like diamond structure here in order to get the ball out there as quickly as possible. And that's essentially um, what all modern football is now. Compact teams with width, like playing combinations and then releasing someone on the far side with third man runs and all those sort of things. Our, um, our, goal, our goal the other day. Um, yes. Is, yeah. Nice, nice goal, man. That's exactly as you described, I imagine, with the when Luke Shaw crossed it for Rashford to score his head. Um, yeah. The combination play in midfield sp sp sprayed out wide, and to Luke Shaw to isolate a one-on-one -on -one situation. Done well, head off his man, crossed the ball, and we scored. Yeah, I mean, it was there was so much more going on in that. Like, I know a lot of people are talking about how in this area here, Sabitzer hit the switch. But when we um, when we get on to talking about um, Ten Hag system, which is, I think it's a variation of um, of Volpiano tactics, but we'll we'll discuss that later. Um, there's a there's a lovely switch in that between um, Sabitza and Wan Bissaka. Yeah, yeah. And good, your man yeah. to Toto or Tonto, what do you call yeah. him? Uh, it's a silent G, isn't it? Um, no, no, no. Oh God. I've struggled all game. I've done a live commentary. Um, yeah. I called him Toto in the end because yeah. I was, yeah, he was killing me. Well, well, uh, Toto, to Toto, Toto, <laughs> um, he uh, um, he got absolutely done tracking Wan Bissaka, like instead of uh, Sabitza. And it's something we'll get into later. But it was a really, really nice goal. And you're completely correct. Is that sure? Um, like we were sort of set up a bit. A bit like this and Shaw was the one who was out supplying width but you can see that we were still compact and this is all I want people to take away from the counter press is that the best teams are compact in attack and in defense because you always have to be protecting yourself um, against transitions we don't want to go back um, to McFred we like we don't want to go back to what United used to do, which was basically something like this, and we just had like Fred and McTominay having to cover all that ground, right? Mm. We don't want that. We want a compact team, um, and we want like nice passing. So I'm just going to stop there for a second, Rich, and uh, we can deal with. Um, like any comments or go through that yeah, again. if anyone's got any comments Noel has one question about Sabitzer actually and his question is um where would Sabitzer's best role be and can the players around him get the best out of him adapt to the style of play I guess that's where, where there's Sabitzer adapts to I don't know a lot about Sabitzer apart before he joined Manchester United I know a lot of people do highly rate him based on Leipzig days I think is the main thing because he didn't play too much and what do you think Mondi, regarding getting yeah. the best out of Sabitzer or Sabitzer adapting yeah, I, I think his best position is going to be in the midfield too. Um, so why? Because what I've seen from him since being at our club, and obviously I've known about him from before, but there's a period of time at, at RB uh, Red Bull, he was playing like in the front three, uh, sort of real high, in the high up um, in the final third and really effective there. But what he does well in the midfield too, he, he plays like Ericsson. And I say when I play like Ericsson, obviously a different player, but they've played a simple way. They keep things ticking over, that sort of play. And I'm glad we got him in because people say, oh, 
you know, maybe expecting to be going into challenges and weights and people and doing whatever. You know, he can do all that. But what I've noticed about him, he plays the way he's facing. He's got switched to play lovely. He's very intelligent. He, play, he plays it simple, keeps it ticking over. And like uh, Bath Time just mentioned there, it was a lovely, um, don't know whether the manager did it, but the way he dropped back into the back three for that goal um, to start things up and allowed wan to push in, inverted ahead of him. And I noticed that. I thought, okay, he's gone back in there. I forget what bath time calls it now when a, a midfielder comes into the back three. I forget <laughs> the name now. But these are things. So you're always watching to see how he plays. And um, he's very good on the ball. He plays the way he's facing. He keeps things ticking over. Um, no frills, but you need players like that. This is how I imagine bath time plays his football. Um, he's a talented player, bath time. That's how I, I imagine he plays football. Keeps things ticking uh. over. He's a team player. And that's what Ericsson does. And that's what Casemiro does. And I think Sabitza does that also as well. And also he reads the game. He can pinch, pinch, I've seen him pinching players as well. So I think him in the midfield too, whether it's with Casemiro, Ericsson or whatever, I think he's a good uh, good player and a good addition to our squad. Yeah, I would I would definitely second that, apart from the bit about me being a, a, a talented player. I'm a very ordinary I'll player. Stop being so I, work, I work very hard. But... Um, the thing that I like about Sabitzer is I've I've told this like off stream quite a lot to Rich and Amonde, so sorry to bore you again with this lads. But I can't stand playing with academy trained players. Um as they filter down the leagues you find more and more of them. And um uh they're too sort of like dogmatic in what they should be doing and they don't solve problems on the pitch. Mm. Like when you think back to someone like Roy Keane Roy Keane, he wasn't worried about registers and all this, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. He knew where the problems were, and he went mm. and sorted them out. He sorted out the space that needed to be filled and stuff. And I saw Sabitzer in the first half. I wouldn't say that he was hiding, but he was playing everything by the book. And in the last sort of 10, 15 minutes... Um, he began to go and solve problems, uh, which I like. I like his physicality. I'm a big fan of players that can win their 1v1 duels. Um, and he seems competent on the ball. People are very excited that he took one shot and it nearly went in. Um, but to be to be perfectly honest, like Fred, I think, got closer with one of his shots than he did. Um, so we'll be... It remains to be seen how good his goal scoring attributes are, but we don't we don't look for pivot players for goals, which is why I might be coming on later to my great theory that Casemiro is not playing where you lot think he's playing. He is not a central defensive midfielder. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so quite happy about that. Have we got anything else? That's just... uh, a quick question about: Do we care if we get knocked out of the Europa League? Um... I know a lot of people. Do you want to quickly address that, Monday? Yeah, I think, look, guys, we should treat this as a showcase game. And we're in so many competitions. I'm looking forward to it. Wow, we're going to the new camp. We're playing against this um, new Barca team at the top of the league. Um, it's going to be great to see us against Frankie. Uh, it's going to be great to see how they deal with Veghorst or uh, Rashford, how they're going to cope with that. Will they play a high line and leave the spacing behind for Rashford to run on to? It's just so many. I'm looking forward to it as neutral. I don't, look. It is a one-off game, uh, two games. Let's enjoy it. Let's not worry about whether we win or lose. Let's just enjoy it and see how we, how far we've come since June last year. How can we manage this game? Because two legs, like we did with Leeds the other day. We had one leg, we solved our problems, came back and beat them. So it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be a tactical battle. It's a new style. It's not a premiership team. We're playing, playing a real good, expansive Barcelona team. I have been watching them this season. They look all right. Just all right. Not spectacular as much just now as long as, as Barton says as long as we're compact I think we can manage them really well but let's just see I'm just let's just enjoy it let's enjoy it it's a great game yeah I mean like as as someone who is sort of vaguely Spanish and has lived there I can't stand Barcelona they are the the Catalans and Scousers are basically two sides <laughs> of the same coin. Like, um, so I do not. I I, I really dislike Barcelona. Um, I don't want yes. to. Um, I, I don't want to to lose to them. But also, um, one of my favourite football players of all time was is a Barcelona player, and it's not Ronaldinho or anyone like that. It's obviously Busquets, um, <laughs> who I think is. Uh, well, I, we've got a chance, but um, I I think that like uh, look, Ten Hag is under ex Ten Hag's very likely to lose his job because of the takeover. 
you don't come in and spend seven billion and keep someone there that you haven't appointed i want ten hag to stay on and yeah. if if he does not beat newcastle and we get bought by an oil state he's gone like when they take over because that's too much of an embarrassment for them like that's one over us and i also like uh, barcelona have big ties in the em in that part of the world as well um so i think it's an absolutely outstanding like i i think ten hag varan casemiro are not gonna let us lose that match there's too much too much pride going on and i just don't want to lose i, I don't want to lose to those bastards <laughs> like i hate them spotify i think it's gonna be a lot closer than people think based on those people based on like you said two legs i'd be interested to see what changes we make for the second leg because i think ten hag does seem to be quite good at problem solving regarding you know you, you face one team and you face them quite soon after i think we've seen i think against man city against leeds maybe against barcelona we might see the same sort of thing that he does actually adapt i don't know so maybe barcelona will take us it's, it is weird actually seeing United versus Barcelona in the Europa League. I don't think we're going to see that again, hopefully, after, after Thursdays this Thursdays are the new Tuesdays. It's the competition <laughs> everyone wants to be in. The Champions League is probably rubbish. the most popular four teams, aren't they, in the world? So, <laughs> yeah. And um, Brad's got a, a good question. I don't know if we covered this in previous ones at all, but how Manchester United right attacking the final week. third, how it benefits Rashford? Similar question to Niall, actually, about how Rashford's been doing so well. Next week. Um to do it very very briefly it's um it's about like rotations and um like rashford like if you look at someone like harland harland doesn't touch the ball very often um and is there to sort of apply the finish and stuff um like rashford's problem always when playing in central areas is that he wants to get involved too much with the play um now he is getting less involved with the play when he's when he's playing centrally he's also like um uh, a lot of rashford's goals are coming like straight away or towards the end of a match because he's improved his sort of concentration levels and things but essentially the team is far better set up and it's offering him a platform and in terms of what's going on in the final third we will probably do that next week this week is about um uh building up building up from the back um and like I think, yeah, I think we should just concentrate on that. So there's a lot, there's a lot of things you can say about player. Rashford, isn't there? We do a whole podcast. I think he looks like he's improved physically as well. He give, he's making more of his chances. But uh, there's a couple of goals where, you know, airily as well, he's improving. I think he's making improvements mm. in lots of areas of his game that people maybe, maybe thought that he didn't have in him. I think a lot of people were questioning whether he could be more of a complete player in terms of like aerial threat. I mean, I'm, I think he's improved in so many things. But uh, there are a few instances where sometimes in the past people might go down easily. And I've seen Rashford holding people off. He's a lot stronger. He looks more confident. I think his um, decision-making's improved as well. Well said, Rich. Um, I'll back you on that one, man. Yeah. The, yeah. You just... Don't worry, mate. You can, you can catch up anytime you want. And I don't know where G-Wolf is, though. G-Wolf's going to have to have detention, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, Maybe right. he hasn't, hasn't done his homework. Maybe that's the problem. What homework did I set him? Was it to do some running? I can't, I can't remember. remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I might have said that. Or, um, I don't know, watch, watch Leeds and don't have an agenda against Maguire. Well, that seems impossible. Um, all right, am I, am I on screen? Yep. You are. Okay, wicked. I'm just checking my notes here. All right, building up from the back. Okay, so we'll do the general principles first, which is like cake. Um, what you, the only thing that you really sort of miss that's important um, is uh, is that teams at all times need to be compact, whether it's an attack or defence. There is one exception, and it's when you build up from the back. Okay, when you build up from the back, you want to be doing two things. One is um, let's just put them in a four four two. One is you want depth, and the way you achieve depth is with your number nine. You want him pushing the centre-backs as far back as possible, because that means that there's more space that you can play in, right? Fairly simple. The other thing you want is width. So um, you, you are going to want, in just a sort of traditional build-up, um, you're going to want your full-backs supplying the width. 
right? And the reason you want your fullback supplying the width is because um, uh, the central midfield, let me just get everyone, the central midfield is going to be the most contested area, right? Because that's, you always protect the centre um, as a defending team. Like you, like, you just can't let people play through you. They have to play around you. So you want... Um, uh, so basically, if you look at this, if you look at what I've set up here, you have got a, a basically a 3-5-2 with the goalkeeper um, making the third. And if you are playing against one striker, you can see there's a triangle here. If you're playing against two strikers, the keeper acts as the third man you'll see a lot of teams that we play with this uh, play against this season um their goalkeeper will be standing in places that david de gea has only ever seen on trip advisor <laughs> <laughs> he's given them a low rating good one <laughs> thanks thanks very much okay so this all right so this is okay so this is the tradition this is just a traditional bog stand up build, build up face okay. well, <laughs> you can you can use it on the um, the, the united agenda on monday if you I saw, if you I saw him visit there once i'm sure i saw him visit that one that place once he came out and just kicked it out played me yeah <laughs> That's funny, bro. <laughs> okay. All right. So here, um, I've set up a team in a traditional like mid block. Okay. So the the thing that we know about a mid block is that there's an engagement zone, which is normally this area here. The first point of um, uh, playing out from the back is you want this zone engaged, right? And the reason you want this zone engaged is because at some point we're going to be looking for one of the wide areas. OK, so we we want to engage them centrally here. Why? Because that keeps that keeps their block central. And that means that the space is out in these areas. Is that is that sort of like fairly under, is that fairly understandable? Yeah. Yeah. So basically what you will do is um, you will pass it around in this triangle, trying to draw them out of position. So when the ball is, uh, let's, let's say that this is ball side. This block is going to be stopping anything coming over on the right hand. Uh, anything like coming down here is going to be blocked off. So the team has got to play out this way. If your goalkeeper is a modern goalkeeper, um, he's going to be able to hit that ball and then you're out, right? And the reason why we say you're out is because you have to beat the first line. Mm. That's the main thing about playing out from the back is you've got to beat the first line. That's objective number one. And we'll talk about a press after this. Um, but ideally, what you what you want to do is you also want to combine it with third man runs which I know is a Monday's favorite thing. So a third man run is very, very simple, but you have three players on three different lines. And if this ball gets played in here and the nine is at his back, a Monday, you can only play the way you're facing, can't you? You can't exactly. be turning, right? Yep. What you would do is you would play the ball out here and now this guy has got space, and most important of all, he's facing the whole of the pitch. Um, so, um, what you so you want you want the players on different lines, and you pass it about until until you get the opportunity where their block is just slightly off, where you're able to break the first line, or you can do exactly the same concept, like this. Where if the 10 has not covered um, and the 6 is just staying where he should be doing, he can he can pop it off and you break out. Now, against Leeds the other day, a lot of people were really, really cross about how slow we were playing it out of the back. 
I'm not gonna like sort of tell anyone that that they don't that you know they don't know what they're talking about. But in any sort of organised football I've played where we've had coaches and you know it's not a Monday like a Monday like washing the kit and stuff. It's a fairly sort of like well thought up. It's a, it's a good setup. Um, you sort of have in this is your defensive third. That's the middle third, and this is the attacking third. Speed increases through each third. When you get to the final third, you want everything to be quick. And in the um, the first third, or the defensive third, you want to play slow and conservatively yep. because you're not compact. Mm. You're abs- As we saw the other day, you're absolutely done if someone makes a mistake. So what you do is you probe about until there's a gap. And it's it's very frustrating when you watch United play because the man in the sticks is not up to this style of football and he's unable to hit the quick switch pass. Um, so that's the sort of the first part of playing out from the back. And I kind of want to pause a bit more than we have done recently to answer any questions that are not about Victor fucking Osman. Um, so, <laughs> so um, it's just, um, I think what's important to talk about why people play out from the back, and I think um, what a lot of coaches do now because they realise when you're playing out from the back and you've got a good goalkeeper as well, you've got an extra man. It's like eleven against ten with the goalkeeper against their ten players. So that's why I think a lot of uh, prem teams now play out from the back because they've got an advantage already. A numerical advantage over the opposition team because their goalkeepers not going to be involved in the play up, playing up. You see, it's basically eleven, including your goalkeeper, against ten. So you should have the extra man. And you explained it really well about trying to beat that first man and create gaps where you can sort of play through. Um, There's a lot of um, issues when we were doing a watch along with the Leeds game, both Leeds game, about how they were, you know, why can't we play out? Why can't we play out faster? Um, but you explained it really well about when you're deep, you've got to play it slow and be um, composed and just work it, work it, probing, you know, and then look for the opening. And that's what I think that's that's the art of it. Um, also, you have to consider, I mean, like, what, a few years ago, they changed the rule where suddenly defenders can come back in the penalty from a goal kick. All your defenders come back in the penalty area and pick it up from there. We weren't used to come outside our box to start the game, you know. But now that's created a whole new dynamic um, mm. for tactical coaches now. You're looking at it and you're like, oh, I can actually start my two defenders. So you can see two defenders starting wide of the goalkeeper. There's so many variations that have been used. I don't know which one is the most effective, but it's based on what you've got. And we haven't got the best keeper who can distribute the ball. So we're trying to work on things right now. Excuse me, the light's gone off. <laughs> Your voice is gone. The light's gone off. Yeah, so we're it's trying to work. On, we're trying to work on things right now. <laughs> There's no power cut. We're trying to work on things right now where we can improve playing out from the back. And I think be patient, guys. Don't get on their back because it's too slow. I've heard a lot of people say, "Oh, it's too slow." Why? What are we doing? Oh, we're going back again. Oh, why can't we just get it forward? You know, we try different options. We play long ball to big horse for a couple of times. The option is, like you said, the wide men uh, the, the, try and get to the fullbacks early. But you saw what happened at Arsenal when we played it to the fullback early. They read that and closed us down. You saw what happened at Leeds with the game at Old Trafford when we were isolated and we were directed to play the, to the right back because of the right side of the, the play. And they were ready for us and they pinched Bruno and they ended up scoring from that. So there's so many variations. It's quite a new. I don't know how many years it's been going, but that it, we the coaches now... They're trying to adapt to this and perfect it and get it right. And uh, our manager seems to be a don at this and he's working with the players that he's got, the personality he's got, to try to perfect it the best way he can. And we're struggling at the moment, but we are persisting with it. I mean, like you say, it's like new. Kate's question here, I was going to say, I think a lot of people may be watching the game, like Kate Kate's question here, and and based on how Manchester United have done over the last couple of years, find it quite stressful watching us play out from the back. So I think they're they're expecting an error. They just want the ball gone. I, I get that view from watching a lot of people in comments on mm. on streams and things. So maybe it's um, you, obviously I think the the point here is that you're looking for a better option. So if there's a risky pass, you go no, let's just pass it back. We, you can find a better option to go forward rather than trying something which is maybe unlikely to work. But I do get this point. And I watched Manchester United maybe a, a year or two ago. You'd watch it when 
were playing out from the back and inevitably a lot of them seemed to end in a mistake. So I can see why it was stressful. And there is that, there is that risk. There is a risk playing out from the back. It's, and people do kind of um, worry about that because it's caught out in the past. And a couple of questions about David's hair. Can he kick? Can he be taught to kick, pass, punt? I mean, right. your like, thoughts on that? We, have, we, did, we did see a couple of games where he did do this a bit better. Look, I think, I mean, I know I put De Gea as the thumbnail as a bit of a laugh, um, but I don't want to get into conversations about talking about De Gea. Everyone now has their view on De Gea. Like, shot-stopping, he's amazing, but that doesn't get you through the press. Um, like, De, De Gea, wh whatever, it's... We, we, we can't be... It's very difficult to play out from the back um, with De Gea, is, is basically what it is. But I'd also like to say that I rewatched the stream last week because I didn't think I did a good job talking about a lot of things. And as you can tell, I'm in a bit of pain today and my, my nighttime sangria isn't really getting my energy up. So we'll see. But I noticed that George in particular had loads of comments last week. And um, like I'm going to do my best to sort of... Um, answer more of them and andrew this is this is essentially my what the argument that i'm trying to present today is that Maguire played very well against leeds which i know will outrage you but if you may, if you let me make the argument maybe we can we can get somewhere like in terms of like understanding each other's point of view on why you think Maguire is a risk because like it's to me it was it was played extremely well by ten hag and man united and uh, it's quite shocking to me like from what i saw from leeds they're in the position they're in and that they took one point from those two games i thought that even though we're all united fans here i i think leeds deserved much more points thank i'm glad i've got permission from you andrew to, to argue what i want that's lovely um all right. Is there is there anything you want to address, Rich, or Monday? I don't know if anyone's got any questions apart from there's obviously um, obviously everyone's got their opinion on Maguire already. Um, so it's, it's uh, the question I would put to people is: We saw Manchester United play Leeds twice. We saw a game with Maguire play where we won two nil, and then we saw a game with somebody else playing, and we look we you know, we didn't lose. It felt like a loss. But we didn't lose. We drew two two, and. Is there not some evidence in those two games that you can look at Maguire and say, okay, he was a bit rusty, hadn't played for a while. He's not the quickest if he's turning, but would you say he was a liability over those two games? I would say he wasn't a liability, but that's that's quite, I won't say he was perfect by any means. He made a couple of mistakes, but I think um, he contributed. If you if you look at ball progression, I know that's that's basically what we're talking tonight. And look at playing out from the back, and he was doing that. He was passing out from the back he was progressing the ball he wasn't losing possession okay maybe once he lost it but i think his other teammates are partly responsible as well yeah and just to add as well i think that like, since this rules come in and play teams are playing out from the back a lot more this is why they want so what they call him uh ball playing center backs or uh i don't forget the term they use but players that could comfortable on the ball so these players now if you look at the stats which I don't really like looking stats, but they're getting more touches now than maybe an old number 10 would get in a game or, or a midfielder would get. These defenders, centre-backs, ball-playing centre-backs, are getting. this is why they need them, because they're getting a lot of touches, a lot of plays, and they're expected to be a big part of the new modern football with this playing out from the back with so many touches that they have. So a lot of talent. There's a guy at um, Crystal Palace called Anderson, um, who's I rate highly. He's got good distribution. He can ping a ball and play it between the lines. Um, and that's what you need as we were sent about these days, as well as the old school qualities, which Maguire does have. I think Maguire played really well. He's my man in the match the other day. People were laughing at me and hounding me about it when I said it on the oh. reaction show. But I really felt that he'd done brilliantly. Uh, just basic things like clearancing, clearances and that kind of thing, uh, interceptions and, and things. There were so many other people that gave the ball away, but against a team like Leeds, it's really difficult to sort of... Um, bring the ball out and we found that in the first game you know so I was really impressed by how, how Maguire dealt with it and uh, performed he was he made a couple of mistakes granted but so, so did other people but 
when it came to like balls being played in, because Leeds, when they tried to break it down, they usually play a lot of long balls or a lot of direct balls. And Maguire was there a lot of the time to clear things up. Leeds had a number of corners in the second half, about four, I count four or five corners um, being whipped into the danger, right into the six yard box in the start in the second half. And Maguire was clearing most of the stuff. They had a chance where he Maguire got himself in the way, which they could have scored from. And if, if Maguire wasn't there, get himself. In a way, he didn't even have to head the ball, but he just his presence alone stopped him from scoring. So I thought Maguire was my man in the match. And bringing the ball out, he was better, I think, with his distribution and carrying the ball out than maybe Varane would have been. Not saying he's better playing than Varane. I just felt for that situation, he proved to be a lot better. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. But um, uh, I'm, I'm on screen, Rich. I just checked, I think. Do we, yeah. do we want yeah, to talk about... To go. Do you want to talk about how we play out against the press? Yeah. yeah, no, let's go. All right. Now, the, fir the first thing um, I want to talk about playing in press, and I love pressing football. I actually really enjoy being pressed because um, you can you, you can like do lots of dives. You can get your foot on people who are man marking you. Like it suits players who are good on the turn. It's one of the only things I can do. So I like being I like being pressed, but. Um, I also love pressing, and there's something about pressing that I don't think is mentioned very often, is that the best presses are disguised presses. They're when you don't know that they're coming. And one way that, that you don't know where they're coming is where you're set up in a traditional mid-block, and then the press is launched, right? You don't want to let the opposition know what your plan is. So with leads who are not they're technically not a particularly good team. They've got some good physicality in their team. Like I, Rob Ailing was bloody incredible yeah. in the two games. Well, like, like um, I, you know, like let's get him in. Um, but anyway, what you so what you tend to find with the press is like everything else, it's a defensive structure. So how how do defensive structures work best? Work best, Rich. The best narrow, compact. Thank you. Yes. Limit space. Exactly. So they, they limit space. Um, now, when we talked the other week about, um, was it Aaron Wambasaka against Leeds who got pressed? Like, uh, did he lose it in the corner for their for their goal? It was Bruno for their first goal, but he was it was where Aaron Wambasaka right. um, passed it to Bruno, and Bruno was under pressure straight away because they were ready for him. It was a trap. Okay, so uh, I'll show you how that should have been avoided more. But once again, it's exactly the same fundamentals of playing out from the back. You need depth and width. So you want your nine to get these centre-backs pinned as far back as possible. And you want players in wide areas. Because what that means is, is that this block has to stay central. Um, because we've got, like, our three men are our full-backs. Yeah. In this case, right? Okay. So what you will find um, is that the best is that to beat a press, you have to eliminate their first line, which is which is this line here, right? Like when you've be, when you've eliminated that first line, most teams will go into a block. So in order to get out of the press, the first thing we're looking to do is get the ball past that line. Yep. Is that that's like everyone fine with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the way that we do that is um, with ball circulation and most importantly with triangles. Um, so when we talk about triangles, I know we've I know we've said this before, but it's so important that play it like so this is this is a triangle here. Um, it's so important that players aren't on the same vertical line because it allows like better combination play. Like if you, if you even like from your sort of like your midfield pivots, you want everyone on different vertical lines. Mm -hmm. So when we're playing out from the back, we will traditionally see the ball go wide straight away. Right. So what you'll find is you'll find something like you'll find something like this happening. Mm -hmm. And they're, they've closed it off, and you can see that they've got these lovely, this is called diagonal pressing, um, where you've got lovely lines like this, um, which means that the whole pitch is closed off. Um, so if the ball does get out to your fullback, and that is what they want, right? So it's an out to in press, 
or is it out to yeah out to in so they're looking to trap the fullback every what you always need to support your players in a press and the way you support your players is you give them a passing option mm. so you will be looking for your players to come in here and if for example the nine goes on to the five which he should never do that's that's a thank you very much because your goalkeeper acts as the pivot and i mean like look that's ridiculous if that happens so the nine is always going to be blocking the pass to the keeper always like and you might you might if you get something as like oppressive as this you can still you can still play back but you've always got the channel ball out um so the, uh, so like the obvious way to beat a press is just to go over the top of it but this is one way to beat a press which is that you have to have triangles around your men like or a diamond in this case and one of the big things that happened to Aaron Wambasaka against Arsenal was um I forget it would have been Varane wouldn't it if he was the right-sided centre back like both Varane and Wambasaka were poorly positioned and it's I'm sure George is in the comments and is saying that it was absolutely De Gea's pass to Varane which I think I'm everything was De Gea's fault I'm not sure <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I wouldn't disagree with George there. Um, uh, but, yeah, I think that um, that played a part. Yeah, they're not that, they're not that specific tonight. They're just general, general De Gea can't play in any, any team. So we're just covering all things with one comment there. Yeah. So um, uh, so you need... So these, these are the takeaways from playing out from a, playing out against a press, is that you need, you need to break the first... You need to break the line. That's the first thing that you do. And there are many ways of doing it. Like um, one of the new things that I've, I haven't actually done, but I've seen done by City, for example, is your pivots will go as wide as possible. And then your nine will run into this space here. Um, and you'll, you know, you play a sort of direct ball in your fullbacks, uh, your fullback will invert. And you can see that we've, we've began to compact this area here. Good shot. Um, yeah, Harlan does this a lot yeah, in City, say, and he's yeah. not very good at it. See. Like, and this is when we talk about Rashford in the number nine. Can he do this? I don't know. Um, Vekos can do this. Mm. Um, so it, interesting stuff. But the main thing is you've got to beat that first line. It's very, very difficult to go centrally, like um, when like everyone's being man marked and to be honest you wouldn't want to go central because uh, like unless i don't know actually unless they have a player like fred who is noticeably poor in physical 1v1s this is it's too much you're taking too much of a chance yeah. to play it to play it into the center so you want to go wide you want players that are good on the ball and um, who support each other, and you want to be working a switch to your three men out here, and that is that's essentially how you how you beat a press. Um, so it's quick, incisive passing, supporting your teammates, staying in position, and basically playing out with a pivot, which instead of being the six, the pivot becomes the goalkeeper, which is essentially Allison, um, like Edison is the best example of this. So. Before we get on to Amonde's favourite, the Salida Volpiana, which is what United are basically playing a variation of, and we talk about how that works, I'd love to see some comments, Rich. So I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah, we'll some questions, comments. I just asked George which players he does like. There's quite a big list, though, to be fair. So he does like most people. He just focuses on on a couple that he doesn't like. Um, this question, De Gea, in or out, I think it's... It's clear that if the manager wants to play a certain way and wants the team to play a certain way, then David Hare probably isn't that keeper. I wouldn't can say I, for negative. Can I, say, Rich, I think like when we the windows shut, we got this one saying always back the players that we have at the moment. We know the limitations, we know what they can and can do well. So the gay is in for me, and we just got to try and work with him and to get the best out of him, you know? Which we which we continue. Yeah, I think to do. um Den Haig has tried with um and he, he obviously he needs to work out the best way to do this, whether it's to ping balls to work horse or whether it's to, I don't, I don't know, obviously he's going to have to try and figure out a solution. But I think the idea is that 
looking at the way Ten Hag wants to play. I don't think David Gea will be his first choice, but I'm not going to say anything negative about De Gea. I mean, it's, I'm sure he's trying his best. He doesn't want to mess up at some things, but also, I think it's just um, the way it is. He's just not suited to what we're trying to do, maybe. Also, I think with when you're playing the ball out, like I play centre-back, I've always been told to play, look, man, one, two touches. Don't uh, dwindle on the ball when you're playing out that because you might see slow and trying to you know probe and all that kind of thing but really and truly you should be playing one two touch football in those in in those areas you know and getting it out early get out your feet early and popping it where you should know drilled it would be a wide man or dragging someone out there's a couple of times when we were watching the game the other day where Sabitza was standing there and uh my colleague Mr B was saying to him why don't you pass it into Sabitza but, um, I think, as Bath time was saying earlier, that that was sort of a trap. If he did pass into him, he'd have to play a pass back straight away. He couldn't turn into trouble because he might get pinched or munched in those situations. So I think the whole point is to make um, get the width of the pitch. And even though they're narrow, it's like the front three was sort of probing. But they weren't splitting themselves. They kept kind of compact and uh, tried to get to the wide man and try to work things from there. And a couple of times we tried to play out the one, two, touch uh, triangles it looks good when it c- comes off because suddenly if it does come off you you're you've got the advantage and i think they're out of shape so they have to track back and get back into shape so it's so important like bath time said i'm nodding like furiously here beating the first line of defense suddenly you can be in a position now another option i think as having ball playing center backs is bath time talking about switching the play early for sharp and playing sharper than that and i think with center backs like martinez he it gets to the point where he doesn't get rushed because you try to rush it, you just roll, you turn, turn his body and start again, you know, and the players realise, right, let me just take it easy on this guy. But Maguire, he tried to play, he did play a couple of sprayed balls uh, from right to left to reach the wide man, get one-on-one situations. One of them got cut out, which I felt what leads I'm really well for because they read that one like a book. Mm. But, um, everyone was complaining, oh God, he's giving the ball away. But I thought he's trying to do the right thing. That's what we've got to do. Spray it early, get it uh, cross field. Because as Bath Time says, the greatest form of defence is a narrow defence or being compact like that. So it's hard for him They're to get over. It takes him a while to get over. So if you can spray a long ball like that, which is a good outlet for me, I, I agree with that. I think um, it, will, it will work. So trying to do the right thing, you shouldn't criticise people for. And I think with Martinez spraying from left to right, or our right side of centre back playing it from right to left, getting ourselves in those situations. Suddenly you got Canacho or Rashford or Sancho running at people, and that's a frightening um, thing to deal with for their fullbacks, you know. So yeah, main, main thing is breaking the first line and getting in behind them. And it's like a chess game of chess out there. That's why I really enjoy watching the start of games, so doing these shows and then going to watch the next game and still watching the start of games. And what are they trying to do to stop us from playing out and how are we solving the puzzle? Yeah, a couple of I questions think you we can go through this quickly. Question, from... Yeah, this is the question. You co- contradicted yourself a bit. Uh, yeah, I think if you're going to play, you've got to play one, two touch in those areas, and I think it, it would bring the ball out. So Maguire got pinched the other day just from turning back and trying to play at home. And by the time he tried to turn and play at home, the guy came in and touched the ball and got away. And luckily, he got back and uh, stopped stopped them in the penalty area and pinched it back. But yeah, I think Maguire maybe does take a few more touches than maybe he should. I think he should get his feet, have it in his mind, bam, straight and early, you know, or at least have two options to pass to. But a lot of these times they're covering the angles of the pass, so you have to sort of reset and say, right, I can't yeah. go there, let's come back home and start again. So that's maybe when you're having six, seven touches. I mean, for me, it's like um, what, like, I know that um, a lot of a lot of people rate Varane. He's up each. Um, but one of the things that Varane does that drives me more mental um, than Maguire taking lots of touches is him driving the ball up to the block. Like, he'll carry the ball up to the block and that plays into the opponent's hands yeah. because it, it, he's blocked it. What Maguire does is he's trying to bring the block out. And if you bring the first line of the block out, you're creating more space in between the lines. Mm-hmm. So it's... It's not something that is just Maguire just doesn't understand that you you have to play quick. Like you don't play quick in defence, you play slow in defence because you're so exposed. The team's not compact. Like we're wide and high, there is no counter press, there's no rest defence, there's no defensive structure to help you out if you get it wrong. And for me, when I see Maguire taking those touches, I understand that 
everyone wants to see this kind of cartoon version of football but it, that's to me that is the football that i've played all my life where you're you're being defensive first you're looking after your clean sheet you're looking after your goal and you're basically you're trying to get the opposition to make a mistake structurally and that that's why i think maguire had a good game but i i mean i can understand a lot of people are sort of like oh slow 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 but if you put like Linford Christie in there, he's not. I mean, like, was it George Ware that ran through a whole team from a corner yeah. or something? Like, yeah. you, like, do you see Manchester City like their centre backs bursting through and stuff like that? No, they play. They they play as slow as United do. The difference is, I'm afraid, is the goalkeeper can switch. Mm. And like, just let's let's just calm down a little bit on Maguire because I think he I think he had a good game. It wasn't a perfect game, um, but I th- I think he had a good game. And the mistakes he made um, was when he wasn't taking touches and playing it carefully. It was when he got a little bit frustrated and tried to make something happen. And I'm and that's that's up to you to decide if you think that's good or bad. But what else have yeah. we? What else? I think have we I got? took issue with the with the ridiculous comments I saw. It's not that I'm saying Maguire was amazing. I think the the comments that were negative were disproportionate to what I saw on, when I was watching the game. They they were just uh, attention seeking like way too far. So that's my point of it. I don't think Maguire had a perfect game, but I don't think he was as bad as the negative comments suggested. Um, if anyone's got any other questions, someone suggested playing three centre backs. I think he just said that to. Stimulate conversation. Is it if Maguire, if um, the hair is not going to be effective at that role? Well, that is uh, absolutely perfect for what we're going to talk about yeah. next. But yeah. um, <laughs> put a pin in that one because um, yeah. it's going to allow me to go on a big run about my dislike of formations <laughs> and how shapes more important than formation. And formation is just for people that bullshit about football. Um, but anyway, that's. I mean, imagine. Uh, I mean, when you look at the game, like you're saying, shape is important. We don't. We're not four-two-three-one when we've got the ball. I no. Hardly ever. Well, I'll be four-two-three-one. There's so much movement, so much rotation. We sometimes two, three, one, four, whatever. If I'm doing the maths correctly, it's it's just it, it changes so much during the game. And uh, this is a great thing to see if we're watching the football. It's not about formations. That's how we set up. Yeah, but when we got the ball you're seeing a whole new expansion happen with sometimes four or five people across their defence uh, waiting for the ball or looking to get spinning behind or whatever. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to watch all this. It's not, I mean, a, the thing that drives me mad about formations is one of the, one of the key fundamentals of football um, is about numerical supremacy, which means having more people in an area than someone else. Like like um you've heard about overloads and things that's where you get more people on one side or in one area of the pitch and what happens in football is that if if you have three people up front the opposition have to have four right Mm -hmm. and if if you have five in midfield you have to have five in midfield you have to you you can't be outnumbered and things Mm -hmm. so as games go and good players are players that exploit understand space and players move around players move around and like the whole shape of a team changes formations are just they're like essentially a heuristic for um for people to sort of explain stuff so when we talk about like playing newcastle or barcelona someone's going to say they play a fluid four two six eight nine triple one allen's taxis or something like that and it just doesn't bloody mean anything what you want to be looking up is how people build up an attack who is their direct winger and like um where they like to compact the pitch like that's that's all you need to know for a scouting report you do, do not do not worry about formations they are the currency of bullshit um but like... i might have to clip that one as well <laughs> currency of bullshit that's what it is okay um do we want to go on to uh salida volpiano yeah let's, let's do right. it. this is a monday's favorite let me just uh uh let me share my screen and this will relate to your um this will relate to your comment um uh cake i think said it right are we are we on screen 
Yep, here we are. Yep, you're right. Okay. So this this is something that was let me just move the enemy team off the pitch. This is something that has been around for about twenty years, and um, I think I f first trained in this in like two thousand six or two thousand and seven, and it is um, from from Pep's. Uh, it's called uh, La Salida Volpiano, which means Volpe v Volpe's exit. Who was a um, a, a obscure Mexican coach that Pep Guardiola went and lived with for three months, which I can't imagine what it must be like living with Pep, uh, an absolute nightmare. And how it works is it's really it's it's really really simple. So if you were going off formations, um, you would like let, let's just put a four two one three or whatever. Um, you would you would expect a team set up like this. So what happens is that one of the uh, midfielders drops um, into the back three. The other midfielder becomes a pivot, and this allows the fullbacks to push up. And fullbacks, I hope you remember this, Amande. Fullbacks are my eternal enemy. They're never allowed to be where. No. Nope. They're not allowed to get ahead of the pivot, ever. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. The reason why is because if you look at the angle of the pass, that is an easy pass. That is a pass you don't want to be making. Right. So the pivot essentially is where everyone gets their position from. And then um, what you tend to see is um, actually, no, we'll go we'll go into this a little bit later. Um, and then like from here. It's, it's up to what the coach wants to do. It can be anything. But the idea is, is that if you're playing against two strikers, nine and ten, there's always, there's always a pass between these guys here, especially if they sit up as a diamond, where you can just recycle the ball about and then hit it out wide when there's a gap in the block. And if you're playing against three strikers, the keeper has to be involved more. Uh, so when when you see it, so when you see a back three, it's not it, it's not to help Maguire, right? It is a really common and well established build up, and if you look at our goal, uh, the Rashford header, yeah. um, some of you might have noticed that Sabitza mm -hmm. um, went on the weak side to. Um, uh, to make a back three, and you'll find Ericsson, sometimes Bruno Pogba did it a lot, filling in as one of the centre backs in order to progress the ball up the pitch. And you can instantly see um, that triangles and diamonds are very easy to make with everyone on different vertical lines. Um, and I'll just check my notes to make sure that I haven't. Um, uh, uh, yeah, um, that's that's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover on uh, Salida Volpiano. It's it's really really common. You'll see it a lot, and you'll see it with Man United because um, I think it might be time to unleash my Casemiro is not playing as a CDM theory. But are there any? I'll just stop it there because like I know George <laughs> will be typing away with smiley faces. Um, Hey, if anyone yeah. got any questions, that's George is distracted by soup this sort of time. I think uh, when we played Man City, I think we saw um, Bernardo Silva drop back in to uh, the centre back mm. of the midfield, the centre 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 back free and bring the ball out because they were struggling. And you think, well, why wouldn't Rodri do that? Because I, I think Bernardo Silva's press resistant, really, and he can do more. And then you think to yourself, who goes with him? Um, does someone have to go with him all the way back now? Someone who's picking up by Bernardo Silva who plays. Rodri, Rodri was also being man marked by our centre forward. There you go. Um, yeah, and that is an example of a player understanding space. And then obviously Haaland, as you mentioned earlier, would come from centre forward into the space that uh, was vacated by Bernardo Silva. Yeah. And watching that develop during the game, it's like, oh, okay, Peps, this is by design. Peps obviously try as he lived with the guy for three months, like you said. Yeah. He's obviously um, worked out this is a way of good method of getting a good ball player coming deep to get the ball and helping uh, against the, the, the press or and being press resistant as well. Bernardo Silva, you try and close him down, he's going to chop chops and you're missing, you know. Whereas you try and close down uh, John Stones or something, you give yourself a bit of more, more of an opportunity to. 
maybe I get quite, the ball I quite like John Stones, but you've got the uh, thing about Ake. <laughs> Ake okay. and, do you still think Ake is crap? I don't think he's crap. I'm, when I'm, based, I'm based on this. I think Ake is he left back, is he centre back? He can play both roles. Okay. Mm. Uh, is he commanding in the air? Maybe not. Is he the quickest? Yeah, he's rapid. I saw him. He beat Ant, uh, Andy in a foot race the other day. I watched that and I thought, wow, he, that's not impressive. Super impressive. But he's just, he's okay at everything. I don't think he's outstanding. This is my thing. I think there's better centre backs. If you're if you're a striker and you come up against Ake, I think you'd be licking your lips a bit, um, in my opinion. I think he's a good player to have because obviously they got no left back. They sold Cancelo or put him away on loan. So they're relying on him for a lot. But I just oh, think. I like Rico oh, Lewis a lot. That's oh god, yeah, yeah, and they've got. I um, really like him. They've got uh, Gomez, Sergio Gomez as well. He's a little guy, gets up and down as well. So I forgot about him, but yeah, Rico Lewis is a bit of a dog, isn't he? But yeah, I think Nathan, Nathan Aki. I, I would fancy my chances up against him than someone else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's fair enough. I I often say Donny Van Der Beek is the one player in the Premier League that I think I could defend relatively well <laughs> against. Yeah. Um, but um. Right. If Casemiro isn't a CDM, what is he? Well, I'll be I'll be honest, Cake. Right. I played in a lot of football teams and I played in very tactical teams and I played in teams that the most fun teams are just let's kick it and have a fight, to be honest. But you kind of get out of those teams as you as you get better. Um, Casemiro is doing something that I haven't I haven't seen. I haven't trained before. So a lot of this is um, is a theory. But I can tell you straight away from the evidence, if you are getting the goal contributions and the, like, if you're getting the goals and assists that Casemiro is playing, it's very unlikely you're playing as a central midfielder, as a central defensive midfielder. That's the that's the first thing to look at is that you're mm. seeing him crossing from half spaces. You're yeah. seeing him getting on the end of things. Like when you think of like the players that are definitely central mid defensive midfielders, like Rodri, like Thomas Partey, mm. they're, they're not contributing anywhere near the numbers that Casemiro is like. And so that should be your first sort of suggestion that maybe Casemiro isn't playing where everyone says he's playing. And, I'll go. In fact, I'll just sort of like I'll, I'll do it now, and then we'll probably finish up um, after this. Um, shout out to G Wolf. Um, so let me know when I'm on screen. Yep, you're up. Okay, wicked. Right. So this this is the formation that Manchester United are playing, where we have we have two centre backs, right? And depending on what's going on. If this is Varane or Maguire, number five, and this is Martinez, you will sometimes see this where Shaw is the left-sided centre-back, right? Alongside um, Martinez and Varane. And sometimes you'll see Martinez is the left-sided centre-back, and where's number three? And Delo is the right-sided centre-back. All right, so we're essentially building up with a back three regardless of who it is and our preferred formation i think is having martinez here because this man has got to be the best passer of a ball that i've seen from a center back for quite some time yeah like his ability to hit wide and inside is ridiculous okay next we have casemiro here and to be completely accurate these players are not on the same lines we're making a diamond between these five, between these players, and they are occupying. Actually, I can't be bothered to draw it, but uh, Ka- like Martinez is in the interior, Delo is in the interior, um, and let's say Varan is central. Then you have Casemiro on the same line, looking like he's playing as a pivot. One of the things that is driving me mental. And Amande can testify to this because I said it the first time we saw Ten Hag play is those fullbacks are in wild positions. Is the fullbacks yeah. are much, much further ahead of Casemiro. Mm. And that suggests to me he's not a pivot. We're then getting, um, actually, we'll do it with the eight. We're then getting three players in central areas. And we have this, uh, this eight or number 10 floating about. So the opposition 
have to set up like this. Right, just off basic football. They, Because of numerical supremacy, they have to have these players central. Right? And they then have to block the middle of the pitch. So we'll put it in... We'll put it in the traditional cross shape. So mm. they're set up. They're set up like that. Okay. This this is just a typical mid block with with the cross, and you can instantly see that we have got options to get out really really easy. Where we hit it to Varane, uh, so we hit it to Martinez. Um, the nine and the eleven go out to press, or let's do it like the nine and the ten go out to press. The six comes in the eight will get into this position here so what he's doing is he is making triangles and he does it on both sides and it's normally ericsson and if this 10 isn't covering properly or this 11 doesn't get out quick enough how often have you seen martinez do that get the ball through the lines yep. successfully Okay, so this is why I don't think that Casemiro is uh, playing as a central midfielder. I think we're seeing something different because what you will tend to find is that the six will go, um, or this six in this case, will get on the eight. The ten will drop back, and he's tr it, originally I thought he was trying to pull the three out of position, but I think he's trying to get the eight on him. And the seven, or, or he's trying to get the seven on him, and the eight tucks in. And what we're seeing is we're seeing the eight going back into this position, which is Ericsson. If you look against Crystal Palace, there was one moment where Ericsson was the covering defender, mm. like he had to leg it back yeah. to get it. So he's yeah. dragging the defensive midfielder out, and Casemiro is getting into these positions. And when we work it to Casemiro, in this position here, we see that his main job is the switch out here, and then he follows the ball in. And the rest defence pushes up, and it will be done like this, or this, or whatever. And Casemiro enters the attack in five. And that is why I think that Casemiro is playing as a sort of like a secret 10 or a mm -hmm. secret free eight. And it's it's really it, it's taken me a long time to sort of get my head around it. But there is there is absolutely no way it's not tactical that Casemiro is getting in this position, switching the ball and then following it in. So what, what would happen by half time if someone's in uh, some phase that build up the six is on Casemiro in a pivot there would the six have to go with him and or do you think he pass him off I think I think he passes him off because like okay. when, he, when when we and, and I think that that's because right we know Ten Hag likes positional play and positional play is basically um where players rotate into different positions uh hang on just let me get that block done correctly uh, Kate, okay. Kate Cadet is just saying, would the solution to that just be to man Mark as a mirror? Well, yeah, he he is he is being he is essentially being man marked because he's he starts off as a nominal pivot. And Kate, like one of the big things in football, right, is that um, the pivot player you'll see you'll see Sabitza do this. Like McTominay is always accused of hiding, but I've. I don't want to be mean to the people that say that, but it's a fundal, fundamental misunderstanding of of football and midfield in general. But it's everywhere, so whatever. Um, but your your pivot will have two men on him because you can't play through the middle. You have to go out wide because wide is an area that can't really hurt you um, because you'll move the block over. So Casemiro is just sitting there occupying two people and a lot of people want, for some reason, they want their pivot to move off the central line and go into these, basically to go anywhere but where they should be in order to receive a pass in between the lines. But that's not what a pivot does. Um, the three eights, which would be the eight and the ten here, um, the six 
has, his job is to pick these up between the lines. Now, I know there's two of them, so you might think, well, how do, how do you pick them up between the lines? The answer is the block, because if the ball is out here and you shift, you shift every one across, So you would see something like this, because remember, we, we, we want to be as compact outlet. as possible. Yeah, and this is our outlet over here. Mm -hmm. This block shifts over and the six will go here. And the job of the block is to stop that getting between, is to stop this area being exploited. And the six here will, uh, people say it's reading the game, but it's really reading the space. We'll read the space in order to come and get them. Right. So Casimiro, what he's doing is basically just just nothing. And then when we split. Right. When, when we split the play like this and we split split our free eights, the block has to widen and the six gets attracted and the ball goes out here. So the ten comes across, the seven comes across, the six mm. comes across, the eight comes across we begin to see Casemiro get mm, through the line true. and we see Ericsson yeah. drop. Yeah. And then Casemiro is part of these players up here. I'll, I'll just put them all centering. You can see that there's five here. That's your attacking unit. And then the other five is the rest defense. And you want these to be as close as possible to each other and then one player as the outlet out there. And Casemiro is basically playing in the hole, in my view. So he starts off looking like he's in a central midfield, but like a central defensive pivot position. But because of the goals, because of where he's popping up, and because of the positions of the fullbacks, I would have to fundamentally reassess 20 years of like football coaching to, to say that he is playing as a pivot. So I'm going to take my medicine now and stop sharing and get ready to be called a fucking idiot from a lot of people. So <laughs> I think Andy's gone. Um, oh, that's but, a shame. Now, if, if anyone's got any final questions, um, obviously, thanks Bath Time and Amondi for great content again. It's good to speak to you guys about the games and like, learn so much about it. If anybody does have any questions, please get them in. Um, hopefully we've answered some of the questions that people have been putting forward tonight. There'll be some good questions actually to discuss. I love that um, just illustration he gave about Casemiro there. You know, it's really interesting to see what he actually does do. You know, he does get about the pitch and he does, you find him getting on the end of balls and scoring the headers and say, how does he do that? You know, and it is, it, I mean, the way you describe it really well, because um, it is difficult. So he has to have a lot of um, understanding of the game to sort of, time his runs and, and do that because it's definitely by design and um, yeah. seeing it on I always like you could talk to me about that I'm thinking, okay uh, but seeing it on a, on the diagram there on the pitch that you have there you can see how it really works and Ericsson's definitely does like I said you gave the example of Crystal Palace this little rotation Ericsson does come in and sit back when Casemiro go forward and just be responsible like that and um, suddenly someone's got to pick up Casemiro you've got an extra man coming in um, to deal with, you know, and he, he's good. Yeah, he's a really, he's a really good player in that respect. We, we did, have, I did have question marks about him initially when he came, um, but yeah, he's shown me a side that I didn't know about because I don't watch enough of La Liga. Um, no, I think it's people focus player. on other players, don't they? And when you watch Real Madrid and La Liga, Casemiro, I don't, I'm not going to say goes under the radar because everybody thinks he's a quality player, but you've got other players ahead of him that you maybe look at more in the game, but. Um, no, it's certainly something to look out for, actually, when we're playing future games. Because I think in the, based on you know, some of the podcasts we're doing now, you, it kind of makes you think about things, about how um, they obviously playing Leeds twice in a week. I wasn't really keen on, on that, but it did give a good opportunity to actually see how we played differently in two different yeah. games yeah. against the same opposition. Um, final questions. We have got some coming in from Kate Cadet says... His final question is, he still doesn't think we're getting enough from Weghorst. And he's he's um, basically using goal threat as the, as the marker. And I <laughs> think, are we using him properly? Is, I, I think I would judge wins and results based more than well, on goal. We're on, a, we're on a, a good run as, as a team and ridiculous fixture schedule that we ha do have. So I think um, Weghorst is doing, doing all right. I know he would have actually got a goal, wouldn't he, if they'd have actually 
done VAR properly because I think the ball comes off a defender rather than Maguire, yeah. so he would have got another goal. But I wouldn't judge him any differently if he'd have been allowed that one. I think I think he's playing really well. I think uh, you just have to look at some of the highlights what he's doing during the games. Uh, he played into his feet. Like look at the other day, he suddenly was playing a lot deeper and linking up the play. Uh, this is a tall, big man you expect to be getting the end of things or winning headers in the box, being physical. But he's got so much about him. Um, you can play into his feet. He pop it around the corner. And we start a move. Just you know, really simple things like third man runs. Uh, that kind of plays or little. Uh, one twos you can play it into him like a pinball machine and then just pop it off and create space for someone else because people will be rushing him and he can just he's very intelligent like that so we can get the best out of him he plays well with his back to goal I think you can't really judge him on goals or like that I like I agree with you Rich I think you just judge our performances and why the manager will continuously play him uh, at the moment because he's very effective I thought he was great against Leeds to be honest like um, he he swapped with Rashford and went into that sort of roving eight role that I discussed earlier. His job mm. is to sort of like create the triangles and diamonds. Um, his hold up play was fantastic. Yeah. Like um, distribution, absolutely fine. Changing the angles of attack. I don't. Mm. I know Cake's got a bee in his bonnet about um, like about how people should just do one thing or something <coughs> like that, but. Yeah, exactly. Strikers should score goals. I mean, look, Kate, we say this every week, bro. But like, Firmino did not score a lot of goals for Liverpool over the last five years. But he was absolutely crucial to how they played. Very good point. Like, mm. um, I would like. I, I understand that. I, th- I think I said this last week that like, that, like, there's this. If you know the exp- expression platonic. Right, it's normally used in a relationship. It's platonic. Like, mm. I don't want to ban this girl. It's platonic. Yeah. Right. Mm. What that what that means is platonic <laughs> means un it means unchanging. Right. Mm. Where the uh, it comes from, I can't believe I'm talking about this. Um, sorry, I'm boring myself. It comes from the idea that there is a shape of a rabbit, and that that has to be a rabbit. And you have a platonic idea of what a striker should be. That they should only be one thing. But yeah. football changes, right? Mm. And roles change, and how it's played is changed. It's constantly like evolving and maturing. And in the past, strikers, wingers their job was to get to the byline and cross. That doesn't happen anymore. You cross from half spaces and your wingers are about outlets and scoring goals and things. Like, I'm, I'm afraid that like, if you keep this idea that a striker should just score goals, you're going to be left behind in the past and you're going to get less enjoyment out of the beauty and the ballet of football. Take a bow. Um, brilliantly said there, Bartha. Totally agree with you. Totally agree. That's true, George, but it doesn't matter where the goals come from. It doesn't matter where the assists come from. And also, I still think goals are overrated. You did say that. but um, Yeah. I don't know. It, no, I, I take that point. I, I always make the... For me, it's... It, the, I, I would say Manchester United, for me, had probably three very good teams. But if you want to look at the, the highest achieving, you probably look at the two that won the European Cup. And I think maybe the 99 team in particular is one that, that spread the goals out quite well throughout the team. So you have a lot of different strikers, but nobody getting 30, 40 goals a season, where at the same time, Liverpool did have a striker getting you know, top in the goal scoring charts and they weren't winning anything. So I know, um, and I, I really love Rude around this story, but I think we were as much Doesn't as have I think a lot he's a great titles, player. Does he? I think we improved as a team without him, which. I don't want to say that. I don't want to say anything negative about Van Nistelrooy because he was a machine, and I absolutely loved Van Nistelrooy. But I think as a team, we were better when we had less reliance on one goal-scoring outlet, and we had maybe like Bruni, Tevez, Nani, Berbatov, sort of, which was a and ridiculous then, team, to be fair. Just look well, at Haaland. Yeah. Like, look, look at Haaland at City. I, I, I mean, like, I did actually make a shocking statement when we look back at it now about how um, Vardy would score more goals than Haaland. But the one thing that I did get right is is that I thought Haaland would make City a worse team because um, there's less rotations 
like Haaland has to be central all the time as he can't really participate in build-up play. Now, everyone would want Haaland at Man United, and rightly so, because you see him scoring ridiculous goals and stuff like that. But he has made City worse as as a team. Um I know it's, it's, just I, I, I agree because I said this in, in someone's stream and uh, people just look like I'm, I don't know, just spouting all sorts of nonsense. And uh, it, it's, it's an opinion, isn't it? Look at look at the league table, where are Man City compared with Arsenal, and you look at the goal scoring record. Like, what, the goals Haaland's putting up, this, the numbers are absolutely ridiculous. They're going to smash Premier League records if he, if he carried on at this current rate, but it doesn't mean they're going to get anywhere near the level of points they achieved when they dominated the league. So that, that's my take on it. The, the rest of the team hasn't got worse. I think it's a different way of playing and it's maybe focused too much around one player. But just to yeah. say, I think that the, the comment here about overcomplicated now football, uh, over tactical and that, I think it's like we're saying, things evolve, don't they? And I think we have to enjoy it. We have to go along for the ride. It's like chess. It's, it's really high tech stuff that we, we have to really embrace and enjoy it it's like with boxing like people most people go into a boxing fight like to see blood guts brawling you know that kind of thing mm. and you get a boxer like floyd mayweather comes along and he's he was unbeaten and people started hating on him because he was just too good he was one step ahead of everyone else his tactics his uh his execution was a, a genius he was a genius out there so i think yeah. with it's just great, isn't it it's, it's things great to evolve isn't they yeah, it's when great I was, when I was watching and, Leeds, and, and I understand it as well. What we're seeing. <laughs> when yeah. I was watching Maguire against Leeds on Sunday, it did remind me of Floyd Mayweather. Was, <laughs> I'm not joking. It was about. It was we we jabbed Leeds to death. Yeah, like that. It was like Anthony Joshua versus Ruiz. We were like we we were just jabbing all the time. We weren't letting them get in the game and stuff. But yeah. when Kate, when you talk about how we're overcomplicating things. All the things we've said are really, really simple. Mm. Like it, it, width, compact, people not on the same lines. These are not like this. Isn't like um, incredible sort of mechanics and things. It's it's just like natural football. I think and what it's is very, maybe very easy, different, very simple. I would say it's different for me. Maybe is that you you see some now managers like Ten Hag do change things during games more than we've seen maybe with some previous Manchester United managers. So it's a bit like other sports where you maybe maybe some. People are expecting, I think, Manchester United to blow a team away in the first 20 minutes, whereas now we're seeing you kind of figure out what the other opposition is going to do, and then maybe you work out a plan to beat them in the second half, or you know, if, if it doesn't, if or at least aren't an easy team to beat. So, um, I think. Um, cakes that said, yeah, sorry. Go on. <laughs> yeah. Ultra Gentleman is boring. Yeah, maybe, but some people, I loved it. I'm a big boxing fan. I never found him boring. I thought it was just like, wow. Did you see that Chet Cook, how he set him up for that? And um, you can see from the first round what people he's setting him up to do. But the other the opponent can't see it. Not many other people can see it. But if you're if you're a coach or a, a good boxer or something, you can see, oh, my God, he's setting up for that. Jab to the body, jab to the body. Oh, here we go again. Your hands come down. Suddenly he's getting hooked to the head. You know, I mean, there's so many different variations of it. This I would think... be a good time for people to join in and say, what sort of podcast is this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's um, right, isn't it? Like, it's like Roy, uh, Roy Jones Jr., is it everyone's favourite fighter who likes boxing? He was incredibly he... fast hand speed. I, I was, was preferred some bias. Um, he did it. Well, exactly, Amande, but he wasn't yeah. a championship boxer. He looked amazing. He fought like he was in street Is It's yeah. athleticism what got him far. He never yeah. practised the art of boxing, you know, and, and I'm sure there's the art of football as well, um, the art of war. And art of, this is why books are made about it. This is why Pep can talk and give a, um, a presentation on his style. Johan Cruyff is a wonderful person to watch talking about football and why he's Sean so Deitch. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there you go. I mean, <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Just going back, uh, we're playing Barcelona in a couple of weeks and I remember what really broke my heart when we used to play our 4-4-2 with Bergie, two strikers, Kanchelskis Giggs, you know, or Sean Lee Sharp. I thought we were great and unstoppable, but we were playing in the dark ages, just come out of a ban from high school yeah. and then we come up against uh, Barcelona um, we lost 4-0 in New Camp, and it was like unbelievable the way they mastered us. And I think from then, yeah, I remember you have that. To learn. That's, that's, I think that's Liverpool was the biggest. Liverpool, Monday, when people talk... sorry, 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 my point. And Liverpool in the early um, 70s, they played uh, Red Star Bell Grable, what they were called back mm. then. They got 
completely, uh, it was a masterclass, the way they played football. And everyone at Anfield was like, wow. And they had to learn, they had to adapt. And go take a bit of pinch of their style and add it to the, the this tough English style that we have, uh, which is incorporated in most of the, our English game. So I saw a comment there about old-fashioned football, um, logging it forward, it being physical, that kind of thing. So if you add sprinkle, that's like making a, a, a recipe. You sprinkle a bit of that, from um, Serbia, a bit of the Barcelona style, a bit of thing. And you can come, and that's what the Premiership's about these days. You've got so many different styles, so many foreign managers coming in. It's, you know, you've got to enjoy it. You've got to embrace it because you have all these shows. We're talking about football for ages. This is great. I mean, we love it. And just, I think we, I, I don't think it's boring at all. I think it's wonderful that we, we've got to this stage now. Yeah, I, I, I think it's great. Um, like, I mean, Brexit means Brexit, and we do have to be careful about multiculturalism. <laughs> <laughs> um but it's it's like there are like people like pep we're talking about him living on some mexican's floor for like a couple of months like you do go you do go around the world and you do try and get like i wouldn't say different ideas but sort of different ways to approach the consistence like there are it's a bit like um gravity right like there there are rules in science that are just rules like you know like every action has to have an equal and whatever mm. and all this kind of stuff but there are different interpretations of of those sort of rules and football is incredibly similar to how it was in 1950 there are differences mm. where the, there's like rule changes like the pass from behind and stuff but inverted fullbacks were in 1950s halfbacks Halfbacks, yeah, and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, I'm really so. I've just seen Cake Dex comment about how he thinks that football is boring now. I've never seen a better expression of football than the Premier League at the moment. Like, any Premier League match is on the level of a Champions League final from 20 years ago. You might not have Zidane doing outrageous volleys and stuff like that. But, like, someone like J James Ward Prowse, the way he plays football and the way he manages. I think the level's increased, doesn't it? Space, throughout the league. Is, is, Definitely. We're, we're so lucky to be a. To, not only to be able to see fucking every fucking football match that you want, especially if you're in Richard's Discord, um, but <laughs> there's just so much. There's, there's just so much. Each week you see something new and you can go and take it to the games that you play. Like,. You know, like I, I assume most people probably play five aside or something. Um, in five aside, everyone like wants to go wide and do their tricks and stuff. If you play compact in five aside with technically good players, you'd be amazed what happens. You're muted, by the way, Rich. He's just chatting away to himself. Rich, you know you're on mute. I know, so I'm talking to somebody else. Oh, right. yeah. oh, it's G-Wolf. <laughs> he just popped in. Um, but I think, like, uh, and I'd also like to say, while Rich is on mute, and I can find I'm, I'm back now, don't worry. I, I was going to um, actually say before, I, was, okay. I didn't want to talk over Mondi, but Mondi was bringing me back memories of when people were getting disheartened by last season and thinking this is the worst we've ever played. I think that game against Barcelona with Stoichkov, Haji, they just, um, it was like watching... Like your, your football team you watched dominate the Premier League suddenly looked like a pub team. And I was just like, what? We, we can't yeah. even get the ball. And yeah. Boston were just like, pass, 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 goal, pass, pass. And it was just, I don't know, it made me think, okay, we need to, that's why when we won the Champions that's League in 99, I was so, I thought it would never happen because we were absolutely nowhere near the level when we first entered the competition. I think the first competition, the game I saw, was maybe against um, IFK Gothenburg or something, 1 4 2. And I was like, oh, I love this competition. And I was like, and we're, we're going to do great. And then, Went to new camp the went, wow okay <laughs> this is like a bit different but and i think it was seen like last year last year we look at manchester City's teams in the premier league we were not on the level at all we're definitely on the same level now we're not necessarily going to win everything this season but we've improved so much and i do i get what um people are saying about some of the um you can you can see some teams maybe approach it negatively because they don't want to play an open game and get thrashed by Man City. Man City have obviously raised the bar a lot. And mm. You can see teams maybe against Manchester United as well in the sort of 90s. They they set up to defend, not to get beaten, and I hope to maybe get something out of the game that way. And it's just how I think it's been like that for a long time for certain games. 
Well, I mean, we had we had Ragnik last year, who, like, when we sort of, like, I mean, Amonde knows that when, like, on, when Ragnik was first being touted as someone, like, everyone was sort of like, we got told by various people how great he was and all this sort of stuff. And then I heard him talk about football, and I was like, I do not want this man anywhere <laughs> near my football club. When he's talking about how he hates sideways and backwards passes, that is, that's absolutely ridiculous. Do you know, George, that tiki taka is like a derogatory term in Spain? It was done by a coach who was like, "I can't be bother, I can't be bothered with this bloody tiki taka, like knocking it about defensive football." I've always found that quite interesting, but um, like. This one- Good George making a lot of good comments. Uh, Actually, I'd like, way, yeah. yeah, no, George always makes good comments. And mm. like, as I said, I watched the stream back last week and George had made a lot of really good comments, mm. but I was too busy, like, wittering away about stuff. But to give George a shout out, um, Rich sent me yeah. a link to a channel which might be called JWB or something. They do something called the World of Football podcast. And it's very funny because the main presenter looks like he's on Crime Watch. He's completely <laughs> in the dark. Like, you can't see his face and the, his microphone isn't very good. So it sort of disguises his voice. Um, and George sometimes goes on it. So it's it, it's like, um, maybe not for like um, the Crime Watch boy, but George is, George is always good value to watch. So, um, and, uh, who's Ke- the Kate Cadet? Uh, um, brilliant comments as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, I, see, he, so I, I agree with some of the comments. I can't remember which specific comment you mean, but Kate Cadet, no, thanks for joining Kate Cadet. Kate Cadet does do some streaming as well. And Good luck, man. Great you know, stuff. It's, no, it's, it's generally interested. I think people in this, in this podcast are generally interested in football, and it's cool not to agree with things. I know some people disagree with everything that people say. That's fine. But at least we can have a discussion about it. And, and Iron you know, sharpens iron. iron. I mean, we've got to need to bump heads. So it's great. That we can have these conversations and talk about things. We, you know, I, I'm I'm learning all the time. I mean, coming mm. on your show from the comments from Rich and Bath Time, it was great just talking about these things. You know, yeah, I learned a lot about corners from a Monday. We had a big discussion mm. once about how to set up at a corner, and I've taken it into the Sunday League, and um, we're, do, yeah. we're doing pretty well. As long as you don't concede from corners, you shouldn't really, should you? No, you shouldn't. But one thing I'm very impressed with Man United is the variation that we've got in our corners. Like yeah. we're doing short, like Sheringham corners and stuff. Yeah. Like, um, uh, do you remember I, we didn't score for ages from a corner set piece for a long time? I, sure I think Richard it said, kept coming up on the screen. It was like ninety attempt. Was it ninety five attempts or something or not something like that? Got close to a hundred, I think, before we scored one. Yeah, like it was. It was. It's been dark days. Like. For, for United but like I'm not I wouldn't say I'm a particularly positive person um, but Ten Hag really does feel like it's it's a new that it, it's a new dawn I still he's not been perfect like Ten Hag obviously has had some issues with dealing with pressing like when you look at Brighton Brentford mm. Leeds like he's he's not quite like at that level but as Amonde says iron sharpens iron and like he's he's adapting he's learning um I'm really I'm really impressed with like Ten Hag Mm. um I don't think he handled Ronaldo as well as everyone says um I think it was ridiculous to bring Ronaldo why why would you why why do you say that sorry to Jay on but what why why Right, so Casemiro and Ronaldo didn't play against Man City and he publicly said he didn't bring them on out of respect no issue with that. Next game against Tottenham, he asked Ronaldo to warm up for a time-wasting substitution, and that was just getting his cock out, saying like, you know, I'm bit like, I'm I'm the man in charge, and I don't, I, I think that anyone with any sort of social skills knows that that's that's not going to lead to like a beneficial conclusion, and maybe that was his plan, but that's yeah, a big doubt no that I, that's a big doubt I have over Ten Hag is that. I'm not sure how good his interpersonal skills are, but as long as the results keep coming, like you know, we're, we're, mm. Old Trafford is a fortress again. People, we're not a light touch. People aren't coming here thinking, yeah, like we can get something today. 
like they're doing what Leeds did and basically just working on defence for an entire week in training. And don't forget, mm. we, we we don't really get any training. We've got games every three days. Yeah. So, I'm like, saying Newcastle fans were in the comments recently saying that they're looking forward to the League Cup final because they basically got one game a week. We've got two. But they're, they're not managing to win on the weekend either. They're, they think they've drawn four of the last five. So that's a good point. The Manchester United, their games are the training almost. They're just having a game every few days. It's, it's crazy. But w- the fact we're winning against these teams is still pretty good. I do agree with Cake, actually. I know everyone was writing Manchester United off against Barcelona. Barcelona, have a, apart from obviously getting knocked out of the Champions League and, and the up in the Europa League, which wasn't great, but they've been domestically very strong. And it's going to be a difficult game. It's going to be one of the hardest. Without tests without Busquets, we we've got a hell of a chance against them. Like, if they had Busquets, I don't care what team he's in. I think that that team are going to be amazing. Like everyone knows that I was banging the drum for the land of my fathers. Um, actually, I'm going to pivot onto this. Like McTominay, I don't agree with this at all. Like I know what you mean, George, about how like Ferguson did did understand he needed to refresh his team, he needed to get bad characters out. But the thing that I loved most about um, Ferguson was that he was he was a sort of loving figure. Like um, he made big efforts to connect on personal levels with his players. And one thing that I've always really like respected him for is that as money came into the game he would he would talk to players about their grandfathers and what their grandfathers mm-hmm. did and try and uh, try and establish like um you know like like beckham was running around with posh spice like rebecca loose possibly um money everywhere and stuff like this and he was talking about his grandfather <laughs> I remember that. may or may not be working in a mine and that's yeah. I, I think that Ferguson's greatest strength was his ability to connect teams and find common ground and get everyone fighting mm. for the cause and playing as mm. a team. So I, I do know what you mean. He was ruthless, but it, it was the more family aspect of him that like I look at as an inspiration for sort of managing people. I think players look up to managers and want to see consistency and say, oh, well, why didn't you do that with me? Why, why did you, I trained well, shouldn't I get my opportunity? Or why am I dropped out of pecking order? Why is there favouritism? Some players always, look at most offices, everyone's always bitching about the boss. So there's always going to be back talking and whatever. But if you can manage that as a manager and manage that situation, keep the harmony majority of the time, you're onto a winner because like you got you need these players to give you everything and to respect you. I wanna when I look, obviously I don't work with these managers. When I look, Martin O'Neill was someone I used to think, well, I'd love to play mm. for him. You know, he'd really sort of uh, stir me up and get me going, you know. That's what you need sometimes. And uh, I think managing is that's why I think managers should get paid the most. It's a very difficult job uh, to keep everyone sweet. Yeah, maybe one day, like um I d I don't think I'm doxing myself by saying that I've got like um beyond graduate qualifications in like psychology and stuff we can talk about like leadership and Mm. things and things like that and like ferguson klopp um martin o'neill something called transformational leaders uh, called transformational leaders um which is kind of what you want whereas most people want an authoritarian leader which is absolute control and all this sort of stuff ferguson was never Mm. that ragnick was an authoritarian leader who was running around saying the squad is shit, like Rashford, let's sell him. That's what like, some people said they wanted, stuff. wasn't it? Some fans said that yeah. I want someone to come in and kick the crap out of players. I'm just, I, that's not my view. I'm just saying that's what some people were saying based yeah, on... I suppose, uh, look, look, it's understandable, isn't it, Rich? Like these guys, you feel like they're let, letting you down each week. Like... I mean, I know like Amonde and Mr. B, who uh, Mr. B's on the United agenda, um, were like sort of like uh, really going in on Fred, saying it's the worst performance you've seen in a Man United shirt. Mm. Fair enough, it could be. But the thing is, is, Fred wasn't hiding. Fred was trying to affect the game and all these sort of things. And like, and all, uh, and. Play, people who don't really play football and I mean like, I had a terrible game like on Sunday and I personally I mean I'm much better than the league I play in to be honest but yeah, I agree with that George like I, I think Pep is authoritarian um, 
and there's a good story about Messi. Do you know the story about Messi and the Coke can at Barca? Maybe no. start, just summarise the Pep, Pep, came, Pep came in and said, right, I'm f- I am fed up. Uh, estoy harto. Uh, I'm fed up of all you guys like drinking Coca-Cola and things like that. You're professional athletes. This has got to stop. Anyone who drinks Coca-Cola will not be playing in my football team. And there was a crack at the back of the room and it was Messi opening a can of Coke. <laughs> And that's that's been confirmed by two different sources that that actually happened. And then Pep Pep started laughing. But like um, I I agree with George. I think that um, Pep is that kind of authoritarian manager. But I I also think that he might be changing because he called his team out the other day for not having a brain um, yeah. and not being able to adapt. And that's something we always talk about, which is managing space. His players. Mm are too like regimented in how they should play football and they don't have someone who will just go and sort a problem out and for Mm. me that's Casemiro's greatest strength is that he understands space like you can you can call it reading of the game and things like that but Mm. he's a big wobbly profiterole he's got he's he's not he's not a physical man but he just goes out he blocks the right place yeah all right, I think that that's us done, isn't it, Rick? Sorry, one well, last yeah, point for me. Like, yeah. one, one extreme, I think, when you hear the England players talking about Capello and um, yeah. they, they were turned off, it turned, they were so turned off by his methods, but he's a successful coach. He was someone who's been really successful. So, like, once again, it's the toughest job, I think, at the top level to sort of manage these guys because how do you go about it? You've got to be ruthless with it. When I say ruthless in how you conduct yourself, you've got to be consistently the same, um, so they can't pick holes in, in you. It's really tough. So respect to all the managers out there. Shout Especially out to Paul. Errol Solo, the mm. transformational leader of the of the United Agenda <laughs> and Rich, our leader. Thank you for having me on. No, absolute pleasure. Cheers, everybody. Some got all the comments and questions in. Cheers, George and Yeah, big Jake. up, guys. And everybody else that's been watching tonight, if you're still in the background, appreciate that. Cheers, Niall. Hope you have a good birthday. Amondi and Vaughan, appreciate it, guys. Yeah, Thank Rich, you next Monday, man. if you're available. Good show. Thank you. And we'll be back um, tomorrow. I think I'll be doing Barcelona preview. So anyone wants to talk about Barcelona, we'll talk about how we're going to beat them soon. But <laughs> until then, have a good evening. What's left of it? Actually, midnight. So see you guys tomorrow. Adios. Ciao.